So friends, we are knee deep into jury selection in that New York courtroom in which Donald Trump is being tried in the first of his four criminal cases. So how's it going so far? Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, jury selection in Donald Trump's first criminal trial, the first of four, is moving along at a pretty good clip. We're only two days into the trial and they already have seven jurors who have been qualified. Now, you may have heard that Judge Mershon, the presiding judge, is going to sit in trial on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. So that means on Wednesdays, we're gonna do a deep dive. You know, we're gonna take a breath and we're gonna try to talk about what's gone on on Monday and Tuesday, what we project might go on on Thursday and Friday, and we will take on a legal issue that has perhaps bubbled up that we haven't really had time to do a deep dive into. So today, I wanna take on three questions concerning jury selection. First is a question that I have been asked several times in recent days, and that is, how is it then with that when Judge Mershon brought the first 96 jurors in, he asked them one question. Who here thinks they can't be fair? Something like 50 hands went up, and those people were excused. They weren't asked any follow-up questions. Is that usual? Is that the way jurors are, juries are ordinarily selected? The answer is no. It's not usual, it's unorthodox. In fact, for this 30-year prosecutor, it's unprecedented. I've never seen jury selection start like that, and we're gonna talk about why that is. The second thing I wanna take on is who are these seven jurors who have been qualified? Where do they come from? What do they do? And what does it kind of portend moving forward? What might this jury look like? And then friends, the last issue I wanna take up is whether prosecutors and criminal defense attorneys like to have lawyers as jurors? And the answer to this one may surprise you. The reason we're gonna talk about this and do a little bit of a deep dive into that topic is because two of the seven jurors who have thus far been qualified are lawyers. But first, let's take up the jury selection process and how it was really unusual. So what Judge Mershon decided to do was bring the 96 jurors, that's wave one, they will be coming in in waves, the first 96 jurors in and pose one question. Do you think you can be fair and impartial in this case? And the reporting is something like 50 hands went up and those jurors said, nope, can't be fair and impartial. I have strong feelings about Donald Trump one way or, or another and I just can't sit as a fair juror in this case. And Judge Mershon dismissed them. He let them opt, opt out. He let them make the decision that they can't be fair jurors in the case. That's unusual. Let me tell you how it ordinarily plays out. And I'd like to use a hypothetical. This is something that I confronted over and over and over again in my years as a prosecutor. And let's take a gun case. Let's take a homicide that was committed with a firearm, which horrifically accounts for so many of our violent crime cases. Seems like we should do something about gun control. So when a, a case involves a firearm, violent crime courtesy of a gun, one of the questions that we always ask the potential jurors is, do you have such strong feelings about guns, about firearms, about gun violence that you can't sit fairly and impartially uh, and be a juror in a murder case where the homicide was committed with a gun, with a firearm? I can't tell you how many times we had lots of hands go up and people said, I have such strong feelings about guns. Usually it was people saying, I'm against them. They do so much harm in our country. We should have gun control common sense gun control. 
every once in a while, somebody would say, I have such strong feelings about guns. I'm pro-gun, I'm pro-Second Amendment, I'm an NRA person, and I have such st strong feelings about firearms one way or the other that I don't think I can be a fair juror. But the judge didn't just dismiss people who said they have strong feelings about guns and firearms and they don't think they can be fair. Instead, we would ask them follow-up questions. It's called trying to rehabilitate the juror. I mean, it's a funny word to use, but that's what we call it. And so I would ask a juror who said they have such strong feelings against guns and gun violence that they don't think they can sit fairly as a juror in the case, I would say, okay, let me ask you this, you know, ma'am, sir, um, if the prosecution's case did not prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt to your satisfaction, would you still find the defendant guilty just because you'd heard evidence that this particular homicide was committed with a gun? In other words, if you weren't satisfied of the defendant's guilt, would your strong anti-gun sentiments lead you to just vote guilty anyway? And friends, I can't tell you how many times in response to that kind of question, a rehabilitative question, the juror would say, you know, w when you put it that way, when I think about it, no, I, I can be a fair juror. Because if the evidence didn't prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, it really wouldn't matter if a firearm was used in the homicide or not. So I, I think I can be fair. I think I can temper or sort of set aside my strong anti-gun sentiments and judge this case and this defendant's guilt or innocence fairly based on the evidence. Now, you can rehabilitate jurors. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But we ordinarily try. But Judge Mershon decided he's not going to do it. He just said, I'm going to let these people make their own decision. And if they say they can't be fair because this case involves Donald Trump, I'm going to take them at their word. I'm going to dismiss them. And we're not going to spend lots and lots of time trying to ask follow-up questions to see if they can be rehabilitated. I think that was a wise choice by Judge Mershon. And I think we now see it was a wise choice because in the first day of jury questioning, after those jurors were allowed to opt out, self-select, um, they've already qualified seven jurors. That's really fast in a case like this. So now let's turn to the second question. Um, who are those seven jurors? Well, let's turn to the new reporting about those seven jurors. This from ABC News. Headline, who are the first seven jurors of Trump's historic criminal trial? And that article begins, with the close of the second day of Donald Trump's criminal trial, seven jurors have been selected to sit in judgment of the former president. A little bit about these seven jurors. Juror number one is a salesman who is originally from Ireland. Juror number two is an oncology nurse. Juror number three is a corporate lawyer. Juror number four is a self-employed IT consultant. Juror number five is an English language arts teacher. Juror number six is a software engineer who works for the Walt Disney Company. And juror number seven is the second of the two lawyers who is described as a white shoe lawyer working for a New York law firm. Regular folk, seven people who are residents of the state of New York, seven of Donald Trump's peers, because Donald Trump will be tried by a jury of his peers. These are just regular people who have been called in to perform jury service, who have said they can be fair and impartial, even to a former president of the United States, even to Donald Trump, regular folk who will sit in judgment of a former president of the United States. That, my friends, is the best of the American criminal justice system. Yes, we have our problems, but a former president who is about to be judged by those regular folk, yeah, that is something we can be proud of. Now, let's turn to what might be an obvious question. Wait a minute, two of the seven are lawyers? Lawyers are gonna serve as jurors? How do we feel about that? How do prosecutors feel about that? How do defense attorneys feel about that? Well, first of all, 
I can't speak for all criminal law practitioners, for all trial lawyers. Certainly can't speak for all criminal defense attorneys. I can't speak for all prosecutors, even though I know and supervised countless prosecutors in my time as uh, chief of homicide at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. I had 30 federal homicide prosecutors at a time with lots of attrition, so I ended up supervising lots of prosecutors. And what I can say is we talk a lot about jury selection, who makes a good juror, who makes a less good juror. I've talked to lots and lots of my friends, some of my lifelong friends in the criminal defense bar, criminal defense attorneys, and we have discussed what, from their perspective, makes a good juror and a less good juror. And here is what I can say based on my experience. Um, I think most lawyers who try criminal cases, whether prosecutors or defense attorneys, will say, yeah, I'm not wild about having lawyers on my jury. Now, not everybody says that, but I think if you were to poll 100 uh, criminal litigators, you would get well over half of them saying, yeah, I don't really like lawyers on my juries. Now, they may say, look, the lawyers are going to be judging me. They're going to be second guessing me. They're going to be grading me. They're going to see if my uh, tactical decisions are sound, if they agree or disagree with them. You know, they'll be assessing whether they could have given a better opening statement or closing argument. And I don't want somebody who is a lawyer sort of, you know, grading my performance, second guessing the decisions that I make in the way I go about trying a case. Lots of lawyers I have heard say that. Um, and obviously, perfectly good observations. You have to be comfortable with the jurors you pick. Um, I have a different view, and it's born of my experience. My view is I generally like lawyers as jurors in my cases. Why do I say that? Over the years, I prosecuted a lot of cases. I really never left the courtroom. I just, I really enjoyed the art of trying cases. So even as a supervisor, um, I carried a full caseload and always tried cases with one of my junior prosecutors who was perhaps new to my supervision. So it would be a good training experience for them. And I got the fun of trying yet another case. So I tried a lot of cases. And I had a lot of lawyers end up on my juries. And after the trials concluded, many of these lawyers reached out and contacted me. Now, let me say, when you try federal cases, um, there is a rule prohibiting contact with jurors after a trial is over. Um, however, I tried lots of cases in the local court in Washington, D.C., the Superior Court for the District of Columbia, what we would think of as state court if D.C. was a state. But, of course, in D.C., taxation without representation is still a thing that, for whatever reason, we choose to accept. So D.C. is not a state. But the Superior Court for the District of Columbia is a lot like any other big city court. Manhattan, Chicago, Philadelphia, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Miami, L.A., Detroit. And in local court in Washington, D.C., where I tried lots of murder cases, there is no rule prohibiting jurors from talking with prosecutors or defense attorneys after the trial has concluded. So I had multiple lawyers call me up. I had lots of jurors actually call me up after cases, but lawyers in particular. And they would all say some variation of the same thing. And they would say, you know, Glenn, during deliberations, there were times when my fellow jurors would sort of begin to spin out of control. They would start, not all of them, but some of them, would start speculating, coming up with wild theories that had no support in the evidence. So what I would do is I would bring their attention back to the legal instructions that were given to us by the judge, legal instructions we were bound to follow. And, you know, I, I should say that when at the conclusion of a trial before deliberations start, the judge gives the instructions to the jury orally and then gives them a hard copy. At least that's the practice in D.C. So they have a hard copy of the judge's legal instructions. And once they find the facts, 
they must kind of plug the facts into the law, the legal instructions, and see if they, you know, are convinced that a defendant has been proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So these lawyers would say, I would draw the juror's attention back to the judge's instruction. Things like um, beyond a reasonable doubt and how the judge defines that for the jury. Because that definition includes that, you know, you, if you have doubt that is speculative or fanciful or not based on the evidence or lack of evidence, that's not a reasonable doubt. It can't be speculative or fanciful. Um, it has to be grounded in the evidence or lack of evidence. So these jurors who were lawyers would say, I would draw them back to the, the instructions of law the judge had given us. Maybe it had to do with the elements of the crime. Elements, each of which the prosecution had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt before they could vote guilty. Or I would bring them back to the defenses as the judge um, explained those defenses in the law. And once I brought them back to the instructions, then they were less likely to continue to engage in speculation and wild theories and hypotheticals that were not grounded in the evidence or the lack of evidence in the case. So friends, once I heard that several times from jurors who happened to be lawyers, I drew the conclusion that, you know, lawyers seem to make pretty good jurors because they understand the way the process works. They understand the importance of the instructions that the judge gives to the jury. That is, it's a guide of how the law is to be applied to the facts as the jury finds those facts. And I am a believer that lawyers generally make good jurors. So more often than not, I left lawyers on my jury. I didn't strike them for one reason or another. And I always was comfortable enough in the case I was presenting that I thought, you know what, if a lawyer wants to grade me, one of my jurors wants to, you know, decide whether I'm making smart tactical choices or poor tactical choices, whether they like or dislike my opening statement, my closing argument, I'm willing to live with that because I think lawyers, and not just lawyers, people in all sorts of professions, but um, lawyers in particular, I found to make pretty good jurors in my experience. So that is our Wednesday deep dive into at least three issues having to do with jury selection. We will be back at it, monitoring every minute of every day of this first Donald Trump criminal prosecution. But I will say, friends, I like what I've seen thus far. I like what I've seen from Judge Mershon. I like what I've seen from the team of prosecutors. And I think they have managed to seat seven at this point, fair and impartial jurors from all walks of life. And um, I have a good feeling. I have a good feeling for how this is gonna play out. But I am perhaps most heartened by the reality that um, a group of ordinary folk from the community in which Donald Trump committed these crimes are going to sit in judgment of a former president of the United States because I think that at least is one giant step on the road to fulfilling the promise that no one is above the law. I have called that a long dormant American promise. But I think we are going to see in that courtroom in New York the promise that no man, no person is above the law realized. Because justice matters. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.